Okay, we're still on Peter and his wry picking of keywords to characterize emperors following Paul's um, convention, which is really the same thing as Daniel. Boy, Daniel really did this in spades. And also what Isaiah 53 had done and what Moses had done. Daniel in particular specialized in this. And I wrote a 30-page Word doc um, showing what verses Daniel was quoting, or not exactly quoting, but sort of incorporating by reference in Chronicles when he did his prayer in Daniel 9. Syllable by syllable, he's going through the kings from David forward, and every single word he uses is hitting on a certain period of each king when that king was good and then went bad to illustrate what, what he was saying in his indictment and, you know, the preamble to his petition. So you'll need to look at the Daniel document to see that style. Um, and then with Isaiah 53, I'd also done it, but I only went as far as Manasseh in Isaiah 53. I've got to go back through that history and, you know, cover it for Isaiah 53, but I did cover it in Daniel. So at least you can see the style in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, I've already covered Paul through uh, Constantine. And now the focus here is to show the um, how Peter is handling the same periods of time to see what it is he's picking up to say. And what we've seen so far is that he's picked up the major characteristics of the time or the emperor with a focus on what the Christian who's actually paying attention to the text in Peter is seeing as a wry com um, comparison of what he's got versus all these great people in history. And that's, you know, really the, was the jumping off point for Paul too. And here where we are is we're at, we're still at Antoninus Pius. The text highlighted in blue and in black in verse 5 is taking you to his death. Now, here the, the syllable ending is 151. We had already gone over how, you know, it's basically starting here that Antoninus Pius goes into power. And he was known to the people at, his, at the time, during his rule, as a guardian, as someone who, instead of innovating or adding to the Roman Empire, or changing it in any major way, what he did is he took what he what he got, what he inherited from Hadrian, and just kept preserving it and ensuring it and continuing it. That's what Toretto really means, is to hold close, cherish, um, guard in the sense of protect, okay? And then he was a temple, he wasn't exactly a temple builder so much as he was a temple a reverer, that's why he was called Pius. Okay, one of the first temples being for Hadrian. He wanted Hadrian deified against the wishes of the Senate. So, Enuranois is real, what do you want to call it? Wry, satirical, okay, about Pius. And what if you were alive during that time, from the start of his rule here, that terem and then, Enuranois is humas, okay. You would be reminded about how fleeting the world is, okay, because this was the reign of Hadrian, and everything about Hadrian, everything that he had, his inheritance, Clenronomian, Hadrian's inheritance perished, you know, basically, you know, Hadrian perished, okay, so his inheritance perished too. Unlike ours, which is Atharton, Hadrian's inheritance was Tharton. It perished. Okay? Hadrian's inheritance was defiled. Okay? And Hadrian himself was defiled in his head at the end of his life. And he was trying to defile everybody else at the end of his life. But ours is Amianton, Kamianton, and undefiled. And then Hadrian himself at the end of his life, of course, died and so faded away. But ours is Amaranton. Our inheritance, we don't die, we go to heaven when we die. And we don't fade away. 
Now, nobody really dies. It's just where do you live after your debt? Hell or heaven? Okay, but, you know, you can consider hell as a kind of fading away if you want. Now, if Hadrian never believed in Christ, and for sure, that's one guy who had plenty of opportunity to know the gospel. Because that was where he spent most of his life, was in Syria, Jewish area, fighting the Jews. So he would have been well familiar with their customs and the Old Testament and all that stuff, which explains to me why he went mad. Because he refused it. Well, he faded away as far as the world was concerned and what was inherent, you know, his inheritance from God to him also fade away. Maybe he was a believer who went bad. That's a possibility. Okay, very smart man. Very engaging personality. Very weird at the end of his life. Okay, well he all faded away. It all faded away. It was all defiled. It all perished. That was his inheritance. But not the Christians. See? how wry this wording is, covering Hadrian of all people. He was one of the most colorful emperors that Rome ever had, one of the smartest emperors that Rome ever had. And that's an epitaph by Peter on his role that you as a Christian during that time would know, and us as Christians now can look back on it and know. <coughs> you see how meaningful the text is now? It's not just a bunch of syrupy words you say in church and, and nod at and say, Oh, that's very nice, Pastor. No, it's real. It's biting. It applies to you right today. Because it's talking about a real life person's lifetime. That you can look at history and know. And oh my goodness. And by extension, hello? That was, Hadrian was one of the best emperors Rome ever had for most of his life. Everybody talks about him, hails him today. He's not forgotten. Okay, but everything he inherited, all that he worked for, this guy traveled everywhere. He was incessantly on the road. And what does he have to show for it? Nothing. So what good did his, his inheritance do him? Nothing. What is your inheritance by contrast? Your inheritance cannot perish, cannot be defiled, cannot fade away. And your inheritance is what? Jesus Christ. He owns you, you own him. He inherited you, you therefore inherit him. I buy a couch, I inherit the couch. It inherits my care. Yeah, well, this is a lot more than a couch, don't you think? Isn't this meaningful now? compared to a real, live emperor in history. Not just syrupy text you hear on Sunday and go to sleep after you hear it. See, the Bible is alive and powerful. It's not some boring, snoozy thing that pastors seldom teach right. I'm not trying to malign pastors. I'm just saying that, you know what? There are a lot of teachers who don't care, and a lot of them who are false. Not all of them. The good are always the few. If it's popular, it's apostate. If it's popular, Christians go after what's a lie or what titillates them. They don't care about the truth. They'd be better off if they were atheists. Look at this. And yet they have the same inheritance as everybody else. That won't fade, won't perish can't be defiled even though they're busy defiling the word of God oh we should only study it in translation oh yeah you're gonna get this meaning out of a translation I don't think so but I'm on my soapbox that's Hadrian highlighted in black what Hadrian could have had and hopefully he actually believed in Christ during his life and when I die I'll see him because that's one man I want to know okay fascinating guy his adopted son Antoninus Pius what characterized the reign of Antoninus Pius Tetremenen and Nuranius is humas and Nuranius is humas that's what characterized him 
That's what everybody said about him at the time. Okay. And he guarded what? He guarded what he got from Hadrian. He thought he was being pious. You get the word play? See that that amen in. Guarding. Holding close. Cherishing. Protecting. And Uranois. Heavenly. Pious. Es humas for you. <coughs> is Peter being clever or, clever or not? And when Antoninus Pius died, presumably an unbeliever, then all that guarding he did exactly bought him what? Nothing. What are you getting, Christian? who's alive during the same time, seeing all these pagans be glorified and tell themselves how great they are, and you feel like a putz and lost and God doesn't love you, and you have nothing? Yeah, until you look at this verse. Sit trance of glory and mundi, Rome. Everything you're guarding and all your piety is passing away. Okay, but God, the real God, is guarding the Christian's inheritance in heaven. That's going to be real important to remember during this period. Okay, because this particular period, at the end of it, 151, is the entry into a big persecution period. Um, not so much by Pius himself, but the Christians who were writing during this period were extremely annoying. Okay? We're talking about, well, Clement of Rome was already dead. He was one of the most disgusting writers in the entire roster of church fathers. You need Pepto-Bismol to read what that jerk wrote. But and then you had Barnabas after him, a total anti-Semite. But then you have Ignatius, who at 70 years old, the man never grew up. At 70 years old, he goes to, to Trajan, okay? Trajan, you know, that's right up here. This is when Hadrian takes over. Okay, right about, oh, you know, let's see, four syllables, ten syllables prior, right about here. Okay, this is when Ignatius dies. How does he die? Oh, he thinks he's so holy if he goes running up to Trajan and says, Hi, I'm a Christian, you have to kill me now. And Trajan says, oh, okay, if you really insist on killing yourself, just go to Rome and register at the Colosseum and get yourself thrown before the lions. And then in what should have been a 20-day journey, okay, Ignatius spends six months to go there writing everybody about what a good martyr he is. He's going to die for Christ at 70 years old. That's the Christian equivalent of Richard Dawkins, okay? Ignatius was childish, like Richard Dawkins, who gets all excited if he has a thousand reviews in Amazon. That's how Richard Dawkins begins his preface of his paperback edition to his God Delusion book. Go read it yourself. That man is 13 years old in his soul. So was Ignatius. So take your pick between the two of them, which was more childish. And these we call our fathers? Pathetic. Okay? Now why am I launching into this tirade? Because by the time you get here in Adrian, these children, these obnoxious Christian and Jewish children, are, are just, the people have had it. They're sick of these Christians and Jews. They're sick of them. Hadrian spent the bulk of his time right during this part, you know, fending off the rebelling Christians and especially the Jews. This is why Aeolia Capilino went up. This was the period of the Bar Kokhba rebellion. And it kept on going even after Aeolia Capilino was built in 140, which is two years after Hadrian dies. So our boy, Ter Ter, Antoninus Pius finished the construction of Aeolia Capilina. So he was still fighting the Jews and the Christians too. Okay, so then what Christians was he fighting? Oh, arch anti-Semite Mathetes. Okay, because an anti-Semite means he's anti-everybody else too. Mathetes, that's a real self-righteous nickname. 
means, oh, student. Yeah, he was a student of hating the Jews. Then you got Polycarp. Oh, he was one of the all-time jerks of history. How anybody can read Polycarp and think that there's anything pleasant there? I don't know. Because all he does is quote scripture to show, oh, see, I can quote scripture, I can quote scripture, I can quote scripture. He never makes any meaning out of the scripture he quotes. He just starts doing it over and over. Okay. Or would you rather, would you rather be an idiot like Papias, who made up false lies, made up lies about John and Mary and Judas and heaven. And he couldn't even read Revelation properly. Okay. He was one of the biggest all-time jerks also. He is one of the guys who ends up being part of the persecution that starts at the end of the black there. Starting about 151 is when persecution started under Antoninus Pius. <clears throat> okay? And that, of course, includes one of the worst, most disgusting of the church fathers, Justin Martyr. Totally anti-Semitic. Now you think, well... Wasn't Ananias Pius anti-Semitic too? Not really, actually. Ananias Pius was actually making a friend of one of the rabbis in Rome. So, you know, he'd be interested in any kind of anti-Semitic activity. Even though he had to put down the Jews in Jerusalem, he made a distinction between, because he's a garter, see, guard. He made a distinction between Jewish how do you want to call it? Being a good citizen, but Jewish. And remember, the Jews were taxed. They were specially taxed. That began in Nerva. Okay? He made a friend of, of one of the rabbis in, in Rome. So he was kind of solicitous for the Jews. But he's not solicitous for sedition. And therefore, he was the guy who completed Aelia Capitolina. Okay? Now, I'm sorry I went into a tirade, but I need you to see the backdrop. There is a convergence here that's being built both in Paul and in Peter about the growing apostasy and disgusting anti-Semitism of Christians. Like the just named Papias, Justin Martyr, Polycarp wasn't so much anti-Semitic, Mathetes, Ignatius, who was just full of himself, watched me get myself killed. Okay. There's a distinction of the, the, of the persecution of the obnoxious Christians and obnoxious Jews versus those who were not. The guardian, okay, who's considered pious, is not going to be persecuting those who are quiet, law-abiding citizens who respect the state. And that's what Romans 13 told everybody to be who was a Christian. But we weren't listening to Paul in Romans 13. So God is no longer listening to our pleas for help when we want to be obnoxious and we spurn his word. So that's why persecution start here, specifically at 151, which you can read about and specifically in the Cambridge Ancient History. They cover this period. I'll be posting a video on that if I haven't done it already by the time you're listening to this one. Okay, so now look, we're still in, I'm sorry it took me so long to get here. We're now in verse five and we're still at Pius. Actually, he dies about here. Depending on how you round the year if we consider this 150 at the end here, then Pius dies here. If we consider this 152, Pius dies here. If we consider this 151, because we do the other one at 150, then Pius dies here. Hold on. Sorry, that was a telemarketer. I always get them. Um, all right, so what's the distinction of this clause about Pius closing off his reign versus this one? 
and this is a killer. I almost fell over when I looked it up. You know, I, I can do, I can handle a lot of Greek words, but sometimes I have to look them up in dictionaries. You know, I've been doing this for, what, 40 years. You know, if you really are diligent in studying Greek, you can learn it in five years. But I was lazy. So I might sound like an expert to you now, but bear in mind that I got into this when I was in my 20s. Okay, so you can be smarter than me in far less time because I was a lazy student. I'm not now. That's all. Okay, look, all this is this is everybody. It's a definite article, but it means everybody. Everybody, by means of the power of God, now watch this. Fru ru menos. Bear in mind this is the verb that is being picked by Peter. In this place, he could have put this verb elsewhere, even in the clause, and it would have the same meaning. But he waits until he gets here. This is when Pius dies. Okay, you can say that Pius is depicted to die there, which would be really clever, because noose means mind or thinking, and at that point he's dead. Okay, unthinking. Okay, unless he went to heaven. Okay. Fururume, which has got a, a connotation with the finite verb, okay? Or furumenos, okay? This is the participle, all right? See, the us ending here is accusative. The us ending here is accusative, all right? So the object of furumenos is tus, everybody. And it's also by extension all of these assets, your kleronomia, okay? It's it's both your inheritance and you. What? Oh, this is a killer. Furumenos means to hold in custody, to keep a strict account, to keep a strict watch over, to keep a strict control over. Now, here's what's so important about this. Kleronomian inheritance always has, in every language known to man, you know, its own translation of the term, a financial idea behind it. And inheritance, when you think of inheritance, you think of money, you think of property, you think of goods, okay? You can inherit things that are other than, you know, commercial items. But generally speaking, the word inheritance in every language, however translated, has a financial connotation. You got that. That's exactly what this means. It has, a, it has the connotation of keeping a prisoner under watch, of keeping something or someone in custody. But its second branch of meaning is fiscal. Fiscal control, fiscal watch, fiscal custody, fiscal oversight, fiscal prudence okay that's what Pius was known for when he died he left the Roman treasury unlike so many emperors prior to him he left the Roman treasury with something like 675 million denarii in the black in surplus that was the inheritance that Rome got from his custody of the finances that's one of the other big things this guy was known for he was fiscally prudent he was very careful how he spent Rome's money he's a really good emperor on on those counts okay and why is that and this is really important to understand dia pisteus by means of through agency of but really by means of faith Faith, and I'm going to say this until I'm black in the face, which nobody's recognizing and they should. This is a commercial term. You can look in Big Kittle, which is also known as the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Look up the Greek word pistis. It is a commercial term for something on deposit in a temple that's the content of a contract. Ooh, you know, like Bible? In the temple of the Holy Spirit, therefore in your head, from the Holy Spirit. And that's why you have faith in it. 
its merits. In other words, Bible is bankable money, honey. By means of faith, you have fiscal control. By means of faith, God has fiscal control over you. God's word on deposit in you since eternity past is your inheritance because the word became the truth and the life and the book of Hebrews is going to play on this. Book of Hebrews wraps itself, as you're going to see, around Mark and around Paul, uh, Peter. It maps, the book of Hebrews maps to Mark chapter by chapter. I, I just learned this. Okay, I'm starting to post the videos on it. This is astonishing, okay? So Peter, looking into the future, obviously God causing him to do that, is drawing a parallel analogy to how Antoninus Pius left the Roman Empire in the black, rich. To how rich you are when you get the word in your head. That means God has custody over you. God has custody over the Bible. It's on deposit. Do you want to get that deposit conveyed to you? Then learn it. And then you all, by means of the power of God, are kept in custody, protection, fiscal control, by means of the Word. Not by means of your own faith. By means of the Word. Believed Word word that is on deposit as a contract in the temple of your body but he's talking about the quality of the word itself the value the commercial value the fiscally sound guarding and commercial value of the word in you which is your inheritance can peter be more clever than this i don't know making an analogy between God depositing the word and keeping sound fiscal control of it in your head, keeping it under custody as distinct from just cherishing and holding close and guarding. This is custody and sound strict control. Could you ask for more wry, parallel, satire, and yet wit, ironic wit, in a sort of backhanded way of praising Antoninus Pius. Could you ask for a more concrete expression of what Peter means by what he's saying here than to have it metered to Antoninus Pius rule, going especially all the way up to here. So that this begins with who? Lucius Verus and who? Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius was all about faith in the gods. Marcus Aurelius prided himself on Greek philosophy. Greek philosophy was soundly based on the virtue of the gods. Well, how about virtue of the real God? Who is like uh, protecting, guarding, keeping strict control, giving you ultimate profit and wealth of his word. Is there anything greater and riches than that? No. And you're seeing a demonstration that there's no greater riches than that right here. Can all of the artwork of all of the geniuses ever painting in human history be as beautiful as those words highlighted in black? Uh, I can't think of anything. And I can think of some pretty spectacular artwork. I mean, I'm a big fan of art, okay? Almost every single period has something that appeals to me. Okay, but this is more beautiful than all of it. That God would have Peter meter like this and make an example of an emperor who probably didn't inherit, an emperor who probably never believed in Christ, who's probably in hell. <coughs> so was his death in vain? No. God is giving him a eulogy right there highlighted in black. God is giving him an epitaph that we Christians can learn from right there in black. One of the greatest emperors of all time in Rome, Antoninus Pius. 
dead and probably not a Christian by here or here. Made an example of so that our wealth, kind of like the Passover, so when we get our wealth in Christ, we don't, how do you want to call it? We respect what it costs to get that. This is a fitting tribute, baby. When God gives you a tribute, that's really something. So signing off for Ananias Pius, and we're going to start picking up here at Marcus Aurelius principally in the next increment. Right here, coming back.